in Idaho, uh, probably the agency that is of that is most brought up to me by those who visit me, whether it's individual citizens, farmers, ranchers, or county commissioners, or uh, mayors, or what have you, is the EPA. And uh, the reason is because the EPA's reach into every aspect of the life of uh, individuals, businesses, and communities, particularly small communities that don't have the economies of scale to deal with a lot of the issues that are being brought to them, uh, there, there's no agency that, that has, uh, I think, a greater reach, uh, unless maybe it's the IRS. And uh, actually, sometimes I, I jokingly think that perhaps maybe the EPA and the IRS are competing to be the one most feared by the people uh, through their enforcement activities. And um, I, I'm sorry to say that, but I, I, I have to say that just in terms of the, the input to my office, from people from across the spectrum. Uh, there's probably not an agency that is more uh, frequently brought up than the EPA because of its far reach. And many of us believe that it's, un it's not necessary, that there's an enforcement mentality that um, is extreme. And that rather than trying to work to find solutions, uh, instead we have an approach at the EPA to uh, force compliance and to utilize very heavy-handed uh, techniques in order to do so. Now, if that's not fair or correct, I would love to understand that. Uh, but I can tell you that it's not what my constituents understand today. And let me just give a couple of examples. Uh, probably everybody's familiar with the Sackett case, where a family, and if you've seen the photographs, uh, I don't think anybody could reasonably believe that, that they were acting in anything but good faith, uh, tried to uh, build a, their dream home uh, near a, a lake in Idaho, and uh, after the fact, it was determined by the EPA that, uh, I mean, after they started, it was determined by the EPA that this was a wetland, even though it wasn't on any wetlands designations or, or anything like that. And the, the bottom line is that in order to deal with this issue, what happened was the EPA threatened this family with fines up to $75,000 a day. They accumulated up to the millions of dollars, I think, I don't know what the final total was before they finally got to go to court. And the EPA wouldn't even let them challenge the compliance order that was issued in court. It claimed that they had, they had no legal avenue to uh, do anything but to comply. And if they didn't comply, they had to face these unbelievable fines that no individual, in fact, probably not many businesses in Idaho could have lived with. Uh, ultimately, the case went to court. The court said that the EPA was wrong, and in fact, that the Sackets did have a right to challenge the compliance order. And um, now that case is, I think, still in litigation as, mm -hmm. the, as they make that challenge. But it's the aggressive act of, of basically demanding compliance, threatening phenomenal fines and penalties, and being rigid about allowing the agency's actions to even be reviewed. Uh, one other example, and then I'll quit. I know I'm running out of time here. And that's the Clean Water Act. And uh, Mr. Kaposis, I know you're involved with this, but the, we've been fighting over whether navigable waters truly mean waters that are navigable or whether it includes ditches and ponds and any other water that accumulates. And uh, courts have now ruled that navigable does have meaning and uh, there were efforts to try to overturn that here in this committee and in this Congress, which were rebuffed. The word navigable is still in the statute, and yet it's my understanding that uh, there is a, a guidance and perhaps rules to follow that essentially undercuts that and does what Congress would not do, and, um, and that's an issue that I hope we can get into in the questions and answers.